you were to ask me a few months ago that I would have to make a video about a new age of book burning, revisionist history, and an overall roll back of many people's civil rights in a shockingly short amount of time, I mean, I wouldn't have been surprised. That seems to be the general way the wind is moving. But the fact that it's moving so fast and becoming so dangerous has really put me on edge. Right now, around the Western world, but especially in the United States, but especially, especially in Florida, the United States of the United States, there's been this uh, attempt to, well, roll back people's civil rights under the guise of defeating wokeism, or it's politicians who are trying to protect kids, not by uh, rolling back the laws that allow for child marriage in America, which is a huge and prevalent issue, but by just making the concept of drag shows and allowing trans people to exist basically crimes. And this is not an old story. Before this, it was critical race theory, which is just a fundamental misunderstanding of what critical race theory is. And before that, it was political correctness, or maybe you've heard the term cultural Marxism. And it's becoming more explicit over time that this attempt to essentially rewrite American history to get rid of all of the history parts of it is essentially the long-term result of the cultural Marxism conspiracy theory. Something that current governor of Florida, Meatball Ron DeSantis, has openly talked about. The thing, though, is that this backlash against wokeism, political correctness, critical race theory, cultural Marxism, is an ongoing attempt to constantly rebrand an extremely dark part of the history of the right. And it's an important part of history that you should never, ever let people forget. So buckle up, because what you're about to learn will shock you, or it won't, depending upon how burnt out you are. It, it's fascism. Just, just TLDR, it, it's, it's about fascism. So give you a quick rundown of what's going on. In an effort to defeat wokeism, a bunch of Republican governments and politicians around the United States are working to censor books, remove information from history class, and crack down on the human rights of drag queens and trans people. And when we've seen this rhetoric go unchecked before, it has led to deadly consequences. So yeah, cultural Marxism. That's what this video is about. How fun, how fun my life is. So I guess that we should start by breaking down the word woke. It's the new right-wing snarl word du jour. The term woke comes from African-American vernacular English, and it is a reference to the becoming aware of the social inequalities and injustices all around us. It got popular in 2014 at the height of the first wave of the Black Lives Matter movement, and has since been co-opted by the right, and basically just turned into a vague term that can be used to refer to anything that a more and more radicalizing right don't like. It's essentially part of the American right-wing project to resist any and all attempts to point out that there's systemic inequalities, especially when it comes to race, and that we probably have an obligation to do something about it. Where things caught my eye is when the term woke became more and more vague, to the point where Ron DeSantis seemed to use it to essentially attack any ideas that were considered left of the Republican Party, and used it to imply that there's some sort of project to use culture to undermine traditional American values. This should sound familiar because the right have been taking terms, stripping them of all actual meaning, turning them into empty signifiers, and then filling them with whatever thing they're mad about at any given time. Before woke, it was critical race theory in the halcyon days of last year. For that, it was political correctness, but another term you might have heard in more radical circles, but is becoming more normal lately, cultural Marxism, which really all of this boils back to. And this has always been around, this basic idea in right-wing circles that the left are trying to use culture to destroy America's Western Christian white foundations. But as I said, this all comes back to constant rebranding of the term cultural Marxism. So what's cultural Marxism then? Basically, it's exactly what I just told you. Cultural Marxism is a conspiracy theory that there is a group of leftists that are trying to use culture to 
dismantle Western society, specifically liberal and Christian values, in some sort of propaganda efforts to subvert society and turn it into one that is communist. Heaven forbid. It began in some rather radical right-wing circles in the early 1990s, but in recent days, it has essentially entered mainstream right-wing political discourse. It essentially originates in a 1992 essay by a guy by the name of Michael Minesino about a group called the Frankfurt School. According to the conspiracy, the Frankfurt School were those Marxists who were trying to do what they called aesthetic alienation. I basically make a culture that's so... And by culture, by the way, I'm referencing like art, media, that kind of thing. So to create an art and media that is so degenerate, to use their terms, that it uh, is so aesthetically ugly that it separates people from their connection to uh, the culture, the people around them. The idea was to break down the ties of family and tradition in order to promote what it called polymorphic perversity, which is a very fancy and rather uh, histrionic way of saying people who are living lives slightly different from the prescribed Judeo-Christian script. I shouldn't say Judeo-Christian, specifically Christian, because as you'll probably guess, this theory is extremely anti-Semitic. But they called this project to undermine society by criticizing problematic texts, a new dark age, a tyranny of ugliness. And oftentimes the Frankfurt School gets uh, credit for doing all sorts of weird things that they had nothing to do with, like essentially uh, pushing the general progressive push of society over the last few decades. One of the more common places you might hear about this is the claim that universities have become these cesspits of socialism and, and left-wing tyranny, where innocent, God-fearing people can't even say the N-word anymore without being criticized by some blue-haired they-them person. First of all, you should get to know the they-them blue-haired person. You might learn a thing or two. But second, this is not the case at universities. It has never been, and it probably won't be. As the theory goes, cultural Marxism has infested the humanities. You know, philosophy and drama and art. And in doing so has created a cohort of young people who have become radical leftists who are trying to ruin every part of the educational process by criticizing it when it does racist shit, and that this is stifling people's freedom of speech. It's very ironic because this conspiracy theory is now being used to just empty out high school libraries. Problem though is that this doesn't bear out. Real studies that have quantitatively looked at universities and what kind of ideas are prevailing have shown that there is no uh, restriction on people's rights at universities, that the student body is not getting more extreme. In fact, in our age of neoliberalism, where really a lot of universities have become the playgrounds for the children of the wealthy, or at least the middle class, you're finding that universities don't tend to show extreme leftist positions like they did maybe in like the 60s or the 70s, but are more becoming a bastion of sort of professional, managerial, class, milk toast centrism. You know, the kind of people who think Matt Iglesias has anything of value to say. In fact, if you break down a lot of writing in the humanities in recent decades, you'll find that Marxism, you know, leftist socialism, has been on the decline, and that most writing in the humanities now seems to fall into more of a postmodern, post-structuralist critique-focused analysis. You know, Michel Foucault, Judith Butler, Jacques Derrida, those kind of people. These have more of a focus on identity groups, gender, race, and not so much of a class-focused analysis like a Marxist would have. In fact, Marxists and these sort of postmodernists have a lot of disagreements, very large disagreements, I should add. And the idea that the right sort of paints these two as the same thing is kind of laughable. What's really happening is that both of them have at least some degree of ideological opposition to ideas like sexism, racism, homophobia, transphobia. At least, you know, the non mopens out there. Hmm. Order King. And not hating marginalized people is what a lot of conservatives identify as being left wing now. In fact, Marxism has been so marginalized in the modern West that we don't even refer to the left when we call people left wing anymore. Now, in many cases, when we refer to the left, we're referring to essentially what is a sort of centrist but more progressive on social issues idea of liberalism. And trust me, as someone who was one of those socialist grad students, 
talking about class warfare and the uh, historical materialism and the dominance of ruling classes over the workers didn't play well in my seminar courses. I recall as a graduate student being the sole Bernie Sanders supporter and getting a lot of shit for it. So this isn't the case at universities. What's this whole deal with the Frankfurt School? What is the Frankfurt School? I really need to know. Somebody please tell me what the Frankfurt School is. Well, Frankfurt School is this uh, flavor of critical philosophy that got its start in 1929, trying to analyze why in capitalist liberal countries there's such a strong reactionary undercurrent. You know, a backlash against all human rights. The people who are complaining about cultural Marxism. The Frankfurt School was trying to figure out why these people show up in capitalist societies. The thing is, though, they were trying to do this Hegelian analysis. Now, I, I don't want to turn into a Reddit meme, so I'm not going to talk about who Hegel was and Hegelian analysis for like a thousand years. But essentially, the idea is that uh, you can intellectually analyze things through periods of taking one idea, taking its opposite idea, and trying to bridge the two, and through that analysis, uh, further develop our understanding of the world. And they try to do this. They had criticisms of the Marxist-Leninist idea of how the world functioned, but they also did not like the way how capitalism worked. And so what came out of it was the Frankfurt School, which essentially focused on trying to look at areas of the ways that our social interactions work that are informed by capitalism that Marx didn't necessarily get into. Mostly because Marx lived in the 19th century and this was the 20th century. The world was very different. And one of the things that Frankfurt School philosophers did was uh, eschew away from making any commitments to political causes and instead focus on critiques and analyses of things in pop culture. So to put a bow on it, the Frankfurt School is focused on looking at aspects of pop culture and using it to understand the role of capitalism and what it plays in our art and our uh, ways that we communicate with each other. But they weren't really committed to any political project to change things, they just sort of criticized. The conspiracy behind it is that the Frankfurt School was doing this in order to get public sentiment away from accepting of traditional values and to, through uh, media, essentially through pop culture, instill a desire for socialism. Minasino, in his 1992 essay, essentially blamed the Frankfurt School for every single part of cultural change that he deemed as degeneracy. And the essay is a bona fide work of crankery, even getting into stuff like MK Ultra and trying to claim that the Frankfurt School were using acid essentially to brainwash people into being leftists. So what did Minicino blame on the Frankfurt School? Well, things like the sexual revolution of the 60s, the civil rights movement of the 50s, the growing acceptance of gay rights in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, at least the early 90s at his point, and how they did it is by writing long and devious essays about how uh, the West are all sexually repressed and uh, once they, you know, fully express themselves, they'll truly be happy. And that once through the power of these essays, everyone had gotten rid of their inhibitions that were, you know, instilled on them by God himself, then everyone would instantly go to Marxism. Silence. Marxism, an ideology known for its hedonism and debauchery. <laughs> and cultural Marxism in the early 90s was also not the full and complete picture because cultural Marxism, as Minasino wrote about it, was another rebranding, because you see several of the leading figures in the Frankfurt School were Jewish, and where Minasino was getting his ideas from come from another theory called cultural Bolshevism. I'll tell you that a lot of what I just told you comes from classical anti-Semitism. Pretty much all conspiracy theories at their root are from anti-Semitism. The concept of a conspiracy theory in general comes from anti-Semitism. Let's just be perfectly honest about that. Now, this was a successful rebranding because a lot of people who wouldn't consider themselves anti-Semitic still bought into the cultural Marxism conspiracy theory, but the neo-Nazis did hear that dog whistle and latched onto it. And there's no place you're going to hear more about cultural Marxism than on the website Stormfront, which is the most popular web forum for actual, literal neo-Nazis. Neo-Nazis believe that the Frankfurt School is responsible for uh, racial equality, for legalizing homosexuality, for women's rights, and basically almost all of the exact same things that Minasino said in his 1992 essay, just more explicit. Because as I said, 
cultural Marxism is just a rebranding of an older idea called cultural Bolshevism. Now tell me if this sounds familiar. In the early 20th century, after the First World War, in the art movement, you had what was called the modernist movement. This was a project to essentially explore artistic venues that were radical divergence away from traditional artistic ideals. This artistic movement began around the same time as the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. And traditionalists who felt threatened by this new modern art movement associated it with this 1917 Bolshevik Revolution and thought that the two were interlinked. And this began to thrive and proliferate in right-wing and nationalist circles. And so in the 1920s in Weimar, Germany, modern artists started to be denounced as cultural Bolsheviks. Then later on, once the Nazis came to power, they used this argument of cultural Bolshevism to actively suppress modern art in order to impose a more traditionalist, what they would consider a racially pure art form. And since using the conspiracy theory of cultural Bolshevism was so popular, it got expanded to apply to anybody who was pushing anything that was secularist or modernist or progressive in really any way. Is this starting to sound familiar? They actively started to marginalize and suppress modern forms of art, actually really any form of cultural product that did not push their traditionalist, racially pure ideology, and they started to label all of it as a term that, while we might not get the exact word, we're definitely going to get something close in the near-term future from the far right, and that is anything they deemed degenerate. Now, this might sound like this is a conspiracy theory against all sort of left-wing movements in order to push this far-right agenda, which is similar to what's happening in the United States. There's actually another level to this, which shouldn't surprise you given the government that started it, and that is Bolshevism was sort of a dog whistle. It was a word that a lot of people could easily agree that they hated because pretty much all capitalist countries like Germany and Italy and France and UK all had a lot of hatred for the Bolsheviks and the communist movement. But there was a high association uh, through a conspiracy theory of its own between Bolsheviks and Jews. Across the Western world, there was a lot of involvement of Jewish people in radical political activism. You could say that it's because of the structural inequality and racism that has led to an entire population of people being economically depressed, marginalized, and pushed out of the pillars to, uh, to progress in society, which, you know, the marginalized, those who don't have a voice, tend to be the ones who then get into more radical politics to try and make some kind of change in the world to better all the people who've been downtrodden. Or you could just blame Jewish people for their own repression and build an elaborate conspiracy theory to try and justify that, which it seems that in the radical right has been more or less the main story. The general conspiracy theory is called Jewish Bolshevism, and it is this uh, conspiracy theory slash just canard, really, that Jews were secretly behind the Bolshevik Revolution and are behind communist movements around the world. This actually began as a way to use anti-Semitism to undermine the Bolshevik movement in Russia. During the revolution, uh, supporters of the Tsar uh, ha who had a long history of anti-Semitism, used this association with Jews as a way to cut support or delegitimize the Bolsheviks. The Nazis then grabbed onto that and expanded it to say that Jewish Bolshevism was a basically an evil plan by the Jews to take over civilization. And so hatred of communists and leftists and anti-Semitism more or less went together. And very often, as I mentioned, a lot of marginalized people join radical leftist movements because they're being marginalized and colonized or whatever. So in a lot of cases, this one's going to be a little spicy, a lot of anti-communist movements tend to be racist-based movements because they're usually trying to suppress people who are trying to fight their way out of colonization. Look at South Africa. Look at Central America. Look at... Uh, <laughs> Look at Vietnam. Anyways, in Germany, cultural Bolshevism and Jewish Bolshevism was intertwined with this general idea called the stabbed in the back myth, which was this made up belief that Jews were also behind the German surrender at the end of World War I because they refused to accept 
that the Germans were uh, basically completely exhausted economically. They had a huge um, attempt to make a big assault, a big offensive in uh, 1918 that failed. There was a socialist revolution in Germany, and it caused Germany to surrender, ending the war. I should also mention, because it's important to mention these things in this day and age, that the uh, influenza outbreak of 1918 also played a large role in pushing the belligerents of World War I to end the war, because more people than had died in the entire war died because of this pandemic and only in a period of about two years. Belief in the stab in the back narrative became official policy when the Nazis took over the government and essentially this and the cultural Bolshevism and the Jewish Bolshevism was all a big program to spin elaborate conspiracy theories in order to build this idea that a certain them, Jews, were undermining society using uh, degenerate art using uh, modernist movements, using progressivism, using anything they could. And to just put a bow on this, just to give you the raw facts, uh, Jewish membership in the Bolshevik movement is greatly exaggerated by uh, anti-Semites. And the reason why you saw a lot of Jewish people in socialist movements around the world is mostly as a response to their material conditions in anti-Semitic societies. You know, a lot of European Jews found themselves uh, as either refugees themselves or the direct descendants of refugees who had been pushed out of Russia because of pogroms had experienced systemic anti-Semitism in every country that they had lived in and just thousands of years of oppression in various different places that they've lived. There's no denying that they would move, join a movement that is based on radical equality and getting rid of these uh, racial and religious-based discriminations. And all of this was fueled by a popular deep fake called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. It's a fabricated text that alleges that the Jews have a secret plan to undermine society and take over the world. And even though it had been verified to be fake, by 1933 Germany was teaching it as uncritical history. And to this day, radical right-wing movements still use the protocols as part of their propaganda. You often find it in a lot of other conspiracy movements because, you know, just repeat after me, Every conspiracy theory movement, if you dig deep enough, goes back to anti-Semitism. The Protocols themselves can trace their origins to Russia in 1903, but is plagiarized and made up of multiple different sources, some of them overt fiction. It's been described as the single most influential work of anti-Semitism ever written. So I dug a little deep there, but you can see that the conspiracy theory that the cultural Marxist uh, conspiracy comes out of has roots in explicit anti-Semitism and the project to essentially eradicate Jews from Europe. Not to say that everybody who believes in the cultural Marxism conspiracy theory are overt anti-Semites, but they are aping anti-Semitic talking points, and at the most generous, at the least, they are buying into conspiracies that by their design are meant to undermine and exterminate entire populations of people. Now let's see if we can talk about this anti-Semitic crackdown on modern art and the tendrils that lead it to our modern day where we see the governor of Florida speaking about cultural Marxism as an attempt to uh, essentially make it illegal to be trans. So the first book on the Frankfurt School to come out in English that did a history of their movement came out in 1973. It was by Martin Jay and it was called The Dialectical Imagination. So about 15 years later, the Free Congress Foundation, which was a think tank started by Paul Raywick, who is more famous for being one of the founders of the Heritage Foundation, uh, came across this work. Instead of a face, he's just got another ass. The FCF tricked Martin Jay into appearing in a short documentary called Political Correctness, The Dirty Little Secret. With the exception of Martin Jay, there were a bunch of people who showed up in this video including people like David Horowitz, many of them being the stars of the future New Right. What Jay talked about was the Frankfurt School's influence over modern-day critical theory, and it was used to spin this conspiracy that, you know, maybe some of the sophomoric excesses of campus progressives actually was part of some great evil plot to bring communism to America. They were trying to destroy the American way of life by using 19-year-olds who read their first book over 300 pages and finally learned what social justice was. Not exactly the smartest plan, but it was a conspiracy nonetheless and it started to become more and more influential. Parts of this interview got picked up by the Conservative Citizens Foundation and turned into another documentary 
called Political Correctness, the Frankfurt School Story. Since Karl Marx proclaimed the criticism was a weapon of destruction, the Frankfurt School critical theory has become the doomsday machine of the Marxist war against Christian civilization. Critical theory is essentially a tool of hate which has stirred discontent and violence amongst groups that consider themselves victims of a hateful system. In truth, such terms as racism, sexism, and chauvinism are powerful weapons in the Marxist psychological warfare against traditional American values. Political correctness, the product of critical theory, is really treason against the US Constitution and against America. The conspiracy theory built in this video takes a lot of very loose connections of people and maybe a couple ideas and uses it to spin this idea that the Frankfurt School is essentially responsible for the creation of the new left, which was a movement that was uh, in the late 1960s, early 1970s of baby boomers in their 20s trying to push for, you know, racial justice and ending the Vietnam War and all those things that made conservatives really mad. And they interpreted it as this great communist plot, which is extremely funny because one of the things about the new left is a emphasis on identity and culture and a move away from talking about class and materialism and anything that actually resembles Marxism at all. But the conservative conspiracy theorists interpreted this in a more sinister tone. Instead of being essentially a rebranding of centrism to call it left wing, they thought that the new left's focus on uh, discrimination and bigotry was more to take attention away from the failures of communism and move towards issues that they felt some Americans would resonate with. By exploiting the legal system and the federal courts, political correctness narrator Bill Rowland concludes, Frankfurt School operatives have successfully oppressed the white middle class and substituted genuine liberties with enforced equality. Through this lens, they interpreted that culture had been taken over by a cabal of cultural Marxists, and they want to use pop culture as mind control. What the Frankfurt School actually did and what they actually stood for got twisted and stretched completely into non-coherence by a insane conspiracy theory that was essentially trying to explain away uh, the, you know, cultural and progressive change happening in the 1960s and 1970s and say that it was not part of the United States, a country that has always been reinventing itself, but is actually the machinations of a foreign bracket, bracket, bracket them. And there were enough Archie Bunkers out there who would buy into that. By 2003, the Southern Poverty Law Center was warning people that this was a dangerous conspiracy theory that was getting more and more traction in mainstream conservative circles. And they warned that this extremely dangerous anti-Semitic conspiracy theory might become part of the mainstream right, which it did. Cultural Marxism became a regular term used by people like Pat Buchanan. Instead of a face, he's just got another ass. And it became part of the central pillars of the Tea Party movement. It also became an obsession of Andrew Breitbart, who started Breitbart, the far-right news media website that has essentially normalized uh, fascist politics with a lot of conservatives today and launched careers like those of Ben Shapiro and any others. Essentially, what Breitbart did was take the culture wars that happen in America and started to associate it with this conspiracy theory. It got so bad that in 2010, Martin Jay had to write an essay calling out this histrionics about the Frankfurt School and called it a, quote, scapegoat for the lunatic fringe. The essay points out that the work of the Frankfurt School has been uh, stripped of its nuance and turned into essentially a right-wing soundbite that can then be used to scapegoat for a bunch of right-wing fanatic causes. He professed himself to be horrified at his bit part in, quote, the transformation of the Frankfurt School into a kind of vulgar meme, a charged unit of cultural meaning that reduces all the complexities of its intellectual history into a soundbite package available to be plugged into a paranoid narrative. And it was very prophetic because one year after the publishing of Jay's essay, Anders Breivik, a Norwegian fascist, uh, wrote a 1,000 plus page manifesto re referencing cultural Marxism many times as he then went off to murder over 70 people, most of them children. I know we've been focused on the United States and Anders Breivik did his horrible crime in Norway, but it does show that the idea has become a global meme. And as many of us who don't live in the United States knows that whatever weird bullshit's happening in America is 
gonna find its way to our country eventually. And within his manifesto, you can actually see quotes of the FCF's documentary about cultural Marxism. So this isn't me speculating here. Breitbart added to the conspiracy, essentially saying that the Democratic Party was part of this cabal to take over everything. He also implicated a Jewish currency trader by the name of George Soros and accused him of secretly funding leftist movements around the world, which is extremely strange because George Soros is extremely wealthy, and let's just say Marxists and socialists are not exactly the biggest fans of rich people. Not to mention the Democratic Party just got over two presidential election cycles where they pulled out basically every gun imaginable to take down a rather moderate social democratic candidate for president. Um, th that guy. And uh, Bernie Sanders, right there. He's, he's right there. I, I'm normal. I'm normal. I kickstarted that, but I'm also normal. Also tied into the conspiracy theory is a guy by the name of Saul Alinsky, who wrote a book called Rules for Radicals. It's an interesting connection. I wouldn't really put Saul Alinsky into uh, radical leftism, but the reason that he's in this is because he was very influential to Hillary Clinton, and Hillary Clinton is very much at the center of this cultural Marxism conspiracy theory, because in the lead up to 2016, where everybody knew that Hillary Clinton was running for president, the far right was trying to build this narrative that if Hillary Clinton wins, we're gonna have the cultural Marxist apocalypse that they all feared, which is very frustrating because I really, really don't like the idea of having to defend freaking warmonger Hillary Clinton, but God, Damn it! She's bad because she has bad foreign policy and is a right-wing neoliberal, not because she's part of some evil Jewish Marxist cabal to take over humanity. Jesus Christ! But cultural Marxism worked as a sort of umbrella conspiracy where you could tie all of the different, you know, non-explicit anxieties about changes in culture, you know, growing acceptance of different people, and changing society, and that slight feeling that the world that you grew up in might have been a bit problematic and that your future, the future might be better, but in doing so, because you can't let go of your bigotries, you might be being left behind. Instead of, you know, introspecting over that, instead you could just say, oh, it's just a bunch of evil bracket bracket thems trying to ruin everything. And it was an extremely flexible thing. Cultural Marxism in actual neo-Nazi circles could be a galvanizing conspiracy about a Jewish takeover of society, but in a more mainstream conservative circle, they could also say cultural Marxism itself and have it be a reference to, I don't know, Stanford liberals who think that racism is bad. And I should also mention that cultural Marxism has a bit of like a liberal offshoot that's starting to grow, where some uh, right-wing liberals who are becoming more and more anxious about some changes in social conditions are starting to also get afraid. They're calling this successor ideology. They're describing that this left-wing insistence on intersectionality and uh, anti-bigotry and progressivism and anti-racism is undermining traditional liberal values. Believers in the successor ideology believe that the ideas of the free market place of ideas and tolerance is being replaced with anti-racism and quote-unquote wokeness. Liberal humanism is being undermined by some sort of authoritarian utopianism, which again is very often just complaints about people getting mad when far-right speakers come to spout their bullshit on university campuses, which is extremely strange because if you look at the numbers, when right-wing speakers come to talk at universities, they get protested but are still allowed to speak anyway because most administrators of universities are feckless centrists. But left-wing speakers don't get to speak at universities because they're often not invited and if they are, typically the speaker series that does it gets their funding cut. Which I'm not going to go into too much details but it happened in a department that I worked in and it ended up basically killing the department. What this results in, aside from the mainstreaming of a lot of extremely dangerous right-wing rhetoric, is essentially an endless stream of culture wars, every single corporate attempt to have some degree of inclusivity in order to make people more happy, gets branded as part of this evil, sinister, by socialist corporations like Disney and M&Ms trying to undermine society, which just shows that the definition of left wing has just completely disappeared by this point. For example, and I apologize, and I hate that I need to talk about this, but Star Wars, there was this, uh, attempt 
to boycott Star Wars Episode 7 because they thought that the lead being a black man, or at least they thought being a black man based on just the trailer alone, was some sort of attempt to undermine white society. It was, somebody actually called it white genocide, which is an explicit neo-Nazi conspiracy theory. White genocide is essentially the neo-Nazi version of, like, the Great Replacement. And during this attempt to boycott Star Wars Episode 7, cultural Marxism came up as the culprit behind all of this. And the less that I have to say about the backlash against The Last Jedi, the only good Star Wars movie, the better. Another attempt to try and link things like Black Lives Matter into this cultural Marxism conspiracy is the book Race Marxism by James Lindsay. In Race Marxism, James Lindsay takes the cultural Marxism conspiracy theory and starts to change its branding so that it can be used for something that speaks more to the moment of the early 2020s when talking about the fight for racial justice. The work that Lindsay does in this book essentially takes the successor ideology anxiety and the conspiracy theory about cultural Marxism and puts it together and gives it the brand new uh, scare word, critical race theory. This then got picked up by a bunch of mainstream conservative politicians and led to a bunch of strange astroturfed attacks on school board members, led to a bunch of conservative politicians cracking down on basically anything that teaches an accurate history of the United States under the guise of attacking critical race theory. And what the book essentially did was take white nationalist talking points and launder them into a buzzword that conservatives could be comfortable saying. And what the Trump era made very obvious to a lot of Republican politicians is that white nationalism and other forms of racism are essentially the voting core of the Republican Party, and they've become less ready to condemn a lot of these talking points, and more likely to try and, in a dog-whistly way, more embrace explicitly racist laws, including Donald Trump himself, who refused to condemn white nationalism in, reportedly, fear that it was a solid part of his base, to the point where one fire national security advisor reportedly said that Trump was largely motivated by a belief in the cultural Marxism conspiracy theory. And so this history that started with the protocols of the elders of Zion that got blown up by right-wing nationalists and fascists during the 1920s, got adopted as official party policy by the Nazis, and then found its way into American politics through various right-wing conspiracy theories, and then normalized through uh, essentially the increasing right-wing radicalization of the Republican Party, has head to its zenith with the career of one Meatball Ron DeSantis. Ronald DeSantis, or Meatball Ron to his friends, is the current governor of the state of Florida. You might remember Ron DeSantis for such things as refusing to do anything about COVID-19, including resisting mask mandates or vaccine mandates, things that led to a lot of Floridians dying. And to fight critical race theory and cultural Marxism, he also passed a law called the Parental Rights and Education Bill, which was a law that goes by a more common nickname of the Don't Say Gay Bill. This law essentially says that from kindergarten to grade three, no teacher can mention if they are not cisgendered or not heterosexual. Because a man and a woman being in a relationship, that's not sexual. A man and a man being in a relationship, that's sex. A cis woman wearing a dress to work, that's normal. Trans woman wearing a dress to work, that's sex, somehow. He also passed a huge anti-sanctuary city law, which is going to do a crackdown on undocumented immigrants living in Florida, and allocated $12 million to essentially rounding up migrants and forcing them out of the state. His response to school shootings was to take retired police and military officers and turn them into armed school guards. Very good sign of a normal country there on that one. And in the 2022 election, he won a massive re-election to governor of Florida and is speculated to be gearing up to run in 2024 as a presidential candidate. And he has a decent chance. When Donald Trump was first elected, I said that what I find scarier than Donald Trump right now is a person who has the same beliefs as Donald Trump, but has a more coherent ideology and is essentially taking notes. And that's essentially what I fear about Ron DeSantis's continuing political career. He has many of the same white nationalist beliefs as Donald Trump, but he's more politically savvy and he knows how to maneuver in electoral politics in a way that he can give red meat to his white nationalist and racist base while saying 
just the right amount of nice things so that your CNNs and your other kind of centrist liberal institutions don't come down on them hard for uh, the break in decorum that Trump did that pissed them off so much. And for fellow internationals like myself, rhetoric in the United States has a way of spilling off into other countries. I've already found articles about Australia having a cultural Marxism anxieties and trying to pass anti-drag, anti-LGBT laws in the name of countering cultural Marxism or uh, anti, like, uh, what's it called? The new um, anti-groomer stuff. And we now have a conservative party leader in our country by the name of Paul Polyevre, who essentially is also leaning into the culture war train in order to get a few seats and take power from Justin Trudeau. I think that it speaks a lot that a lot of their attacks on things like critical race theory, on the Frankfurt School and critical theory in general, happened because that field has its roots in trying to interrogate and understand fascism, which I have been dancing around, but at the end of the day, that's what this is. It's fascism. Hey everyone. I just wanted to start by saying that I really like this sweater. But the other thing I wanted to talk about is the F word. No, not fuck or fuck or fuck or even fuck. I'm talking about a series that I've been wanting to promote on this channel for a really long time. And as we're talking about far right and fascist ideology and how the ideas spread, I can finally promote this series that I've been obsessed with ever since I started watching it. So you're a fan of the channel Second Thought, right? You don't have to answer that, first of all, because this is a video, but second, because I already know you are, I look at my channel analytics and I know that Second Thought's very popular. Everyone loves a good JT video. And he has a wonderful series called The F Word, which is a history of fascism and how fascist ideas spread both in the lead up to World War II, but he's building towards how they have elaborated and moved into dominant far-right ideas in modern day. You know, similar to what I'm doing in this video. And so if you want to learn more about the ideology behind this whole cultural Marxism thing, I really recommend getting giving it a look and you can go and watch it on Nebula. Yeah, that's right. The F word is a Nebula original because there is no way JT could have made any money off of something like that on regular ass YouTube. Nebula is a streaming service where creators like myself and JT came together to make a platform that was our own. Creators who want to make things that they feel are important or just that they feel need to exist in the world, platforms have shifting rules. Or, if you're looking at the whole debacle with Twitter, could just be gone one day. Sometimes you make a video on a topic you find very important, but a platform can't sell Pepsi ads on it, and so you're the one who's gonna lose out because Pepsi is gonna win. Pepsi always wins. Hashtag Pepsi always wins. If you sign up at the link that I'm going to put on the screen now with movie magic, but also on the description, you are not only getting an awesome service in my opinion, but you're helping me directly. A portion of your membership fees will go to me directly for as long as you are a member. And for those who've already signed up, I'm very grateful you know that I heart our Nebulons out there. Nebula subscribers get really awesome bonus content like my full Noam Chomsky interview and they get videos early, but one of the coolest things they get is access to something called Nebula Classes, where several creators on our platform have made entire courses about how they do the important things they do. Uh, so you could, you know, watch those to learn the practical skills on how to become a creator and do this kind of nonsense yourself. One of my favorites is by Trace Dominguez of Uno Doso Trace, that it talks about uh, how to Google like a pro, in which you get some advanced online searching skills, which are integral for doing research in modern day. Especially if, you know, you lose your access to the university library system like I did several years back. Anyways, Nebula Courses is great for aspiring creators or just those who want to see how we do the things that we do. So again, if you go to nebula.tv slash step back, which you can get a link in the description, you can sign up and you'd be supporting me directly, but you'd also be getting 40, 40% off an annual membership, which comes down to about two and a half dollars a month. Take care, let's get back to the content. Republican politicians following in DeSantis's footsteps are using this panic about uh, trans people and drag queens to lead a rash of anti-LGBTQ laws across the country. In some cases, like in Utah, 
using the power of the state to discriminate against what totals to about 13 kids. And if people thought that it was just going to be focused around groomer stuff, it's already expanded to restricting trans health care for children, but is growing into a restriction on trans health care in general, which makes it not too much of a stretch to show that this is an exterminationist campaign against transgender people. You know, I'm going to get comments saying, oh, you call everyone fascist, but uh, can we... Can we not? Are you really this intentionally blind? Politicians in the United States are actively trying to exterminate an entire class of people. And at the same time, school libraries are completely empty because every book that taught something approaching accurate history has been removed for being critical race theory. People are not an ideology. And for the people who are saying it, Transgender ideology is going to go down in the history books right next to the Jewish question. Funny how many times in just a few years since it's been out, I've had to go back into the Folding Ideas Dan Olson's video about Flat Earthers and specifically about QAnon. At the end, he says some pretty poignant stuff that always resurfaces whenever I discuss these topics. Because in the video, Olson hits right to the heart of what reactionary forces are about. The world is becoming more complex. We're starting to understand the world better. We're starting to understand humanity better. We're, sp we're starting to understand each other better. And to people who want a simple worldview where there is a distinct hierarchy that they are on the top of, this is extremely threatening. And this work is in denial of reality. If anything, they see strength in how well they can deny reality because the idea is that through sheer force of will alone, they'll be able to force reality to conform to their simplistic idea of how the world is and should work. Second, it's my belief that this uh, recent moral panic about trans people and about groomers is a way for the Republican Party through sort of obsequious means to make inroads with QAnon believers, to essentially act as a dog whistle to people who have bought into a neo-fascist doomsday ideology. And in this age where we're really trying to make some sort of difference for marginalized people, for black people, for LGBTQ plus people, terms like critical race theory or cultural Marxism act as thought terminating cliches which is a term for words that are used to stop conversation and halt thinking about what the other person has to say. And so what do we do? I'm always of the belief that a lot of what's happening right now is a result of hopelessness. The environment's falling apart. It's becoming increasingly obvious that the dream that free market capitalism sells to all of us is a lie. And instead of trying to build the narrative that there is a better world, there is a way to solve what seems like these insurmountable problems. The center-right liberals that we now call the left just give us promises of managed decline. We've sort of given up on the idea that we can improve human life and that we can actually deal with the problems that hurt our society. And that results with the only people having a story about how we can make the world better are doing so by simply scapegoating the most vulnerable among us. We're all financially precarious. We're all socially isolated. And the only answer from this neoliberal hegemon is, that really sucks, brah. So I guess I'll say what I say in a lot of my videos, and that is what we need to fix these problems is social solidarity, uh, and a vision for what a better future can look like that is not being framed by the far right or by a neoliberal learned helplessness. And also, I think that there are deep-seated biological things that make us vulnerable to reactionary thinking and authoritarianism, which means that anti-fascism, the efforts to counter fascism wherever it shows up, is not just a good thing to do, it's a necessary thing to do. And any society, even one that became utopian in the future, will always have to be on guard because this type of thinking short circuits our brain and makes us do dangerous things. And so on one hand, let's reach out to the world and build the society of our dreams, one where we live sustainably, where people are equal, and there's no such thing as a person who goes to bed hungry and cold on the streets. And with the other hand, punch a Nazi. It's uh, Pepe's become kind of a symbol. Alrighty, thank you so much for watching. Hey, I have a Patreon and I'll see you guys next time. Woo!